quarrelling will bring disunity uh, among the church. And then in verses 9 to 10, he addresses women, how uh, the need for modesty in their dress and their outward adorning, adorning uh, of, of good works. Because of an ostentatious and seductive style is not conducive uh, to, to Christian women's inner adornment of godliness. This is in contrast to the Greco-Roman Greek world. Uh, where women would be adorned uh, elaborately. And finally, he moves to the duties of women in, rela in relationship with men in the church and public worship that they are to learn, verse 11, in quietness, with submissiveness, and verse 12, that they're not to teach and they're not to exercise authority over the man in the church. And then Paul in verse 13 gives us the biblical basis uh, for such a prohibition. Verse 13, because the order of creation. Adam was born first, and, then, and verse 14, that Eve was the one that was deceived first, not Adam. So we see here, don't we, in a, a society where gender and roles are all disorientated and uh, flipped around, here we see that there are two genders recognised, male and female, and they're not just rooted in this cultural context of the church, but these roles, and male and female, are rooted in uh, true biblical hermeneutics, in that they are tracing the ancestry back, tracing all back through Adam and Eve, in the order of creation and the fall. It's not just some cultural context that Paul is writing into, what he's teaching here is normative because it's seen throughout the whole of the scriptures because this text this passage has been a great battlefield hasn't it and it has in a way brought divisions between man and woman and man and woman have been fighting over as it were and it's as a scene as if somehow God is bringing women down, keeping them uh, constra uh, constrained, as it were. But really, it's anything but the truth. It's liberating, uh, enabling women to flourish, um, enabling men and women to come together in a complementarian way, as it is designed by God, that they, as it were, are a team together. And they have unique roles uh, to play to. Just as you consider a, a, on, a, on a football pitch where there's players and there's a manager and a coach and they all have different roles. They're all on the same team, as it were. And these roles, of course, are rooted in the scriptures in regard to our relationship with Christ. We see... In 1 Corinthians 11, 3, it says, The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And of course, Christ, the man, is under Christ, and the woman is under Christ. And he's under man. In the church, verses 11 to 12, are clearly taught that women are to learn submissiveness, and men to, are to have the teaching authority. And that's why here at Council of Baptist Church, we wouldn't, have women teaching and preaching in the context of the public worship service. Where, because we see that this is not just Paul's opinion, this is scripture, it's the normative pattern uh, throughout the whole uh, of the scriptures in regard to men and women's roles in the church. Well, let's just take a look at the text. I just That was just a bit of an overview. Um, firstly, we can say that men are instructed in every place to pray aright, to pray aright. I desire that in every place men should pray. And this goes hearts back. I desire, Paul desires both men and women. And here it just says men, doesn't it, in regard to prayer and their roles. Today, liberal scholars would seek to discredit Paul's teaching and differentiate the rest of scriptures from what Paul is teaching, but they negate the harmony of the whole of the Bible. 
they would see that the cultural expression here is no longer relevant today. culture has changed and moved on and paul was writing to his particular cultural context with these instructions but he's writing with these instructions because this is the normative pattern that is seen throughout the whole of scriptures so many want to accommodate, don't they, an ever-changing culture and context. This is obvious because back in March 1994, 32 women were ordained as priests in the Church of England, despite the clear instruction of Scripture. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. The Apostle is not simply penning his desires or thoughts or speaking into a cultural context which is no longer relevant, but he's penning the very word of God. All scripture is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16 We cannot begin to rip up sections of uh, the scriptures because they don't fit into our, our current cultural context. Because these are normative biblical truths and that's why Paul takes it back to Genesis. And the creation account of Adam and Eve. And now Eve and Adam, Eve was brought forth as a helper. Both, both are made in the image of God. And both are one in Christ Jesus. But it's the complementarian nature of men and women. They have uh, differing roles. And in regard to prayer, of course, women can pray. This isn't saying that women remain quiet and women cannot pray in the church. It's obvious that we see, and if we see through scripture, we see in the church of Corinth, women prayed and prophesied. We see on the day of Pentecost, when they were all in the upper room, they met for prayer, and prominent women were there, and they prayed together. Philip had four prophesying daughters who exercised a particular ministry alongside their father who was an evangelist but no this regardless of quietness is in regard to the public teaching and preaching of scripture in the church and that's why in verse 12 it says she is to remain quiet so the apostle is not just simply penning his own words here to Peter says, doesn't he, about Paul's writings. He writes this way in all his letters, speaking in them about such matters. Some parts of his letters are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. So today, as we hear God's word regarding roles and behaviour of men and women in the church, consider your thinking. Place yourselves under the authority of the whole of the scriptures. Do not cherry prick your way through it, but submit to it and allow it to shape your thinking and receive it as it really is the word of God. Look, scriptures desire all men can pray. Look, he desires that men should pray. I desire that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. This is all men, not just elders and deacons. All men should pray. And he desires all kinds of men uh, can, can be said of it. Uh, in verse 4, he desires all kinds of people, men, to be saved. He desires all kinds of men to pray. So everybody, the whole church, from all walks of life can pray. The only criteria is that they are holy men, that they are saved, that they are set apart unto God, that they have a good standing in the household of God. It's saying here that all men should pray and they should lead in prayer. It was custom for men in the Jewish synagogues to lead the reading of the Torah, the teaching and the prayers, and the women would remain in the Galilee, listening to the prayers and teaching of the men whilst looking after the children. And so it's no surprise that this is sort of carried over into Christianity. Although men, it is men who should be leading, yet what is different here in the early church, although men leading prayer, women did pray in the church. Okay? As I've already said, I'm just repeating myself, aren't I really? 1 Corinthians 11.5, we can see there, women prayed and prophesied. And from the outset of Pentecost, Acts 1.14, all continued in one accord and prayer and supplication with the women. And so, 
Here we see an honoured mention as well of faithful women in Acts 1, 24 to 25. While it is said they prayed, this is the whole company, it was evidently one of the apostles would have led those prayers. As the women prayed, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, with the Amen. So the Lord desires all men to pray. But this isn't saying that men aren't that, that men are to lead in prayer, but it does not say that women are not to pray. In regard to remaining quiet, it's in regard to the matter of authority and the teaching of the, of the scripture, that they're not permitted to teach and that they are to be quiet. And next we see that men should pray everywhere, not just in consecrated places like churches. We can pray in the hired halls, in the lecture halls of Tyrrhenius in Ephesus. We can play in homes like Philemon in our own home. We can play in public and open spaces like at the water's edge in Lydia. And even in prisons like Paul and Silas. We can pray wherever, anywhere and everywhere. We can pray in the closet. We can pray, I don't know, on the beach. We can pray anywhere. We can pray while we're driving the car. Keep concentrating on the road then. <laughs> but we can pray everywhere. This is what it's saying. I desire it in every place. What is important about prayer, men and women, what is important about prayer is not the sacred space, but the inward desire of your heart to pray. And we can pray in all different places. In fact, prayer cannot be contained to one place. And men should pray aright as well. This is a prayer right. Lifting holy hands without anger or quarrelling. Here we see the important conditions attached to when we pray. Because we can pray amiss. We can we cannot feel like prayer, do we, sometimes? Because we're not right with God. We can find that there are to be hindrances to praying the right. For instance, lifting holy hands. We know what is here is about, I'm not on about dirty hands. I'm not talking about washing and sanitizing your hands before you pray. But the outward activity of our lives aligns with the inward reality of our posture of our heart, which is humble before God and laid before him. There's an illustration about the father who prayed at the dinner table for grace, and he gave grace. And yet during the meal, he complained about the, the sausages and the roast and the, the food and everything that he was eating. And his young daughter asked him, His daughter asked him, has God heard your prayer, Daddy? She saw that his prayer had become rote because his complaining spoke of a different posture of heart. Internally, he ticked all the boxes. He said all the right words. It's so prominent for me this. I have to do this week in, week out. Tick all the right boxes, but is the posture of the heart right? Then, Paul reminds us in Psalm 24, doesn't he? It reminds us of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in that holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. It's about the outward activity of life, one's behaviour which is manifested. It corresponds with the inward reality. If hands are defiled with sin, it's of little use to raise our hands in prayer before God. We must bow ourselves and humble ourselves and repent before him. Isaiah 59, 1. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. Many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Isaiah 59, 1. So we can make lengthy prayers. We can say lots of prayers. We can pray all over the place. But if our hands are dirty, they're not holy. What is it? And then another hindrance to 
prayer is that men are to refrain from anger and quarrelling. We must be men who pray without anger and quarrelling in the context of the household of God. We must conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Anger comes, doesn't it, when quarrels and divisions are brought into the life of the fellowship. It disrupts, it causes havoc. It will hinder prayer. Of course, we all have different temperaments. Some of us have a more tendency to flare up in anger than others. Some are more calmer and laid back. But whatever our temperament, we are instructed as men to control our anger here. It's true for men, it's true for women. James tells us, doesn't he, be slow to become angry. angry. Refrain from quarrelling with one. It's not befitting. It doesn't belong in the household of God. That's why he writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31. This is the church, isn't it? Let all, let, let all uh, anger and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice. This is a cause of keeping the unity and the bonds of peace and love and fellowship in a church. When anger and quarrelling prevails, a church will be divided. Just like in a household, when a husband and the wife quarrel and anger, it divides, doesn't it? Surely we know that all too well. Or am I the only one? We must search ourselves to deal with our outward lives, our conduct, to be holy, to deal with our temperaments. And then we go and move on to the next section of, of women here. Scripture desires for women's adornment in the household of God, verses 9 to 10. Likewise, so likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold or pearls or costly attire, but what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. A women's adornment here we see is to be modest, modest in dress and in looks, and their behaviour is to be self-controlled, as all this is proper for a women who profess godliness with good works. So it's not just men who are to prepare their hearts and their inward being, but also women as well prepare their inward godliness and outward adornment and out outward lives of good works by being self-controlled and adorning themselves with this inner beauty of godliness, which will be outwardly uh, seen in, in the way that they dress in appearance and their works. Paul here recognises that women are beautiful and should adorn themselves and exhibit that beauty. This is not a biblical warrant for ladies to neglect yourselves or conceal your beauty. You know, like some um, Shiite Muslim lady fully garbed up in all in black and covered up. No, you should take care of your appearance and your dress. So how should a woman of God adorn themselves? Well, he gives three directives, doesn't he, here? In regard to women's dress. Adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. It's not easy to separate these words one from another, but women are to dress with modesty, with clothing which is appropriate and respectable and affirms that inner beauty of the woman, but also discreet. The woman is not to wear clothes which is revealing, suggestive, seductive, or ostentatious. On the other hand, neither is scripture calling for women to neglect her apparel in dour and kept manner, which fails to enhance your beauty. And I, I think this is a universal principle, isn't it, through all cultural contexts for God's women, for God's women regarding dress. And then he talks about a women's about women's appearance, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. 
And like the first part of this verse, this is not an absolute bar, ban on all braided hair. It's not saying ladies don't go to the hairdressers, or no, maybe you've not been able to see the hairdresser uh, for months. But um, it's not saying that you're not to go to the hairdressers. And it's not saying you're never to wear gold or you're not to wear jewellery. It's not an, an outright ban on these things. Or never to dress elegantly. After all, the church is the bride of Christ. And she is beautifully dressed for her husband, Revelation 21 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. The context here, the issue is that women's hairstyles, the jewellery and the clothing will have different meanings in different contexts. And the thrust of the scripture here is speaking about the cultural context that they're in there, in the Roman Greco world, where women would have had their hair plaited and have had gold and pearls and precious stones, very costly attires, adorn themselves. And they would have spent hours in this pursuit. The lesson for Christian women here is today that to be cautious, not, go, not going down the same path. Remember these women, some of them would have come out of the world which was in Ephesus where there was the, the, Diana, the, the, the temple of Diana, the shrine prostitution, and they would have been adorned with braided hair and expensive uh, clothing and seductive clothing, if any, maybe. And they would have attracted the travellers and the merchants coming into Ephesus to taste their wares. Our world entices young girls, doesn't it, from a young age to dress in suggestive and seductive way. The music industry with artists like Little Mix dress and act in an enticing way. The fashion industry and its beauty industries, for those who are older, is a multi-million pound industry. But both men and women can overtly succumb to have a strong obsession over appearance and obscene amounts of money can be paid for attires by designers. We need to be cautious, everything is modesty. There's an unhealthy interest, isn't there? in regard to outward adorn, adornment and bodily appearance today with plastic surgery. People get plastic surgery done which can cause further breakdowns with body dystopia and anorexia and mental illnesses. There's nothing wrong with getting your hair done or wearing makeup or wearing jewellery per se but Women need to be cautious and adorn themselves in a way which is proper for women who profess godliness. For you no longer belong to the world, but to Christ. And you are the bride of Christ. So adorn yourselves with the beauty that's befitting Christ. And then that there's thirdly, the, or secondly, is it the inner adornment? But verse 10, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So Paul ends here reminding us that there are two uh, types of feminine beauty. Yes, the outward physical beauty, but also the inner, the moral beauty of character which adorns itself internally and shows forth outwardly in good works. You can see something of this in, in the New Testament, can't we? Women in the New Testament. Uh, Acts 9, 6, Dorcas or Tabitha, she was full of good works and acts of charity. Uh, Mark 14, 6, uh, Mary, the sister of Martha, who uh, washed the disciples' feet or anointed his head with pure nard, so expensive that the disciples were complaining in regard to the matter. And Jesus said, why are you complaining at her? She has done a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. I love that word when he says that about Mary. She's done a beautiful thing. 
Or even remember in Luke chapter 7, the sinful woman whose outward act character was known by all, and yet inwardly God's grace had began to work in her life and change her life as she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears and anointed him with perfume, kissing his feet. And when Simon the Pharisee had neglected Jesus and not even washed his feet or cared for him, here was this woman who's had this inner beauty at work in her life, although outwardly it appeared different. Because God, from this point, you think, God doesn't just change a person like that, it takes that time. But that inner beauty was seen in this woman, in her good works, which was manifested. And this is the inner beauty which is valuable in God's sight, a gentle and quiet spirit full of good works. By God's grace, bestowed upon ladies, may it be valuable to you also. And thirdly and finally, the roles of women in the household of God. Verse 11, that a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, and Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Somebody once wrote a book, didn't they, that um, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, which really speaks about how different men and women really are at times. It's not a Christian book, so... <laughs> This, uh, somebody wrote that years ago, and I think it stands out most on the wedding day, doesn't it, itself, when the big day arrives, and the husband wakes up, he relaxes, he has a full English breakfast, and he, his mates come round, they go they go round, they have, they, they have got a nine-hole golf course, casually, and then uh, it's time to get to the chapel, time to get to the church, so off they trot, and there they are waiting at the chapel for his beautiful bride to come. Meanwhile, uh, the wife, is, she wakes up first thing in the morning, she's uh, panicking, is the hairdresser coming, is the makeup, art, makeup person coming, and uh, all the bridegrooms, are they, are they getting themselves ready? And uh, she's beginning to organise everything, making sure that everything is done proper. And in her mind, she's going through the, 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 the ceremony, everything that she has to say, she travels down in the car, She's repeating everything that must be done, and uh, she's saying, "I've got to go down the aisle. I've got to. I've got to go down the aisle. I've got to uh, get to the altar. I've got to sing a hymn." And then she alters it so she just comes through the doors of the church. I've got to aisle, altar, and hymn. And then she's saying it as she's going down uh, the aisle, aisle, altar, hymn. And then she gets at the vicar. And he's just about to go out and she shouts out, I'll alter him! <laughs> the reality is, of course, that neither is it the woman's place to alter the man or the man's place to alter the woman. But it's the Lord's place to alter them both. Uh, we both submit ourselves under the word of God. Some women and men believe that Paul is writing here to undermine women, but in reality, Paul's teaching is doing the contrary. He's instructing and nurturing men and women in the household of God, their God-given roles, and which is clearly evidenced in the whole of Scriptures. Men and women are created in the image of God, and in that image, they are one and yet are complementary to each other in their roles. If that is clear, that Eve was given to Adam as a help. He was taken from his side. He was a helper. She was a helper to Adam. They complemented each other. Adam needed Eve. Eve needed Adam. We see that also in the, in the family, don't we? In Ephesians chapter 5, in marriage. How the two become one flesh. It's a profound mystery. Eve, that the woman submits to her husband as Christ submitted and gave his life for the church and the man. 
loves his wife as Christ gave his life for the church. If a man is the salt, the woman is the pepper. They complement each other. They bring glory to God. In fact, the apostle, like Jesus, put great store on both women who worked alongside him, like the apostle, co-workers in, in society were women. This was a society where women were devalued, insignificant. They weren't allowed, their, their testimony wouldn't be given in evidence in a, a court. They couldn't be heard. But in Christianity, we see that God raises woman up to a true status and a true God-glorifying position. And so the apostle seeks to readdress the balance here, giving authoritative apostolic instruction of what is permitted in the church. It's probably that the false teachers, some of whom were women and they didn't know what they were talking about and what they were teaching. And as a consequence of this, he has to address this matter because it's not a biblical normative that women should be having authority in teaching over a man in a church. It, it goes against the teaching of scripture and the pattern of scripture and the roles of men and women. So that's what he addresses. Women, of course, are to be students of the word. Of course, men and women, both men and women are students, but women are to be students, not teachers, in the household of God. So we know that Ephesus was full of those false teachers and some of whom would have been women. And Paul is, address, Paul is addressing this with Timothy, would address it. Again, I repeat, 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man. Therefore, as men place themselves under Christ, so women should place themselves under men who themselves are under Christ. So there's two prohibitions here in the context of the gathered church. I do not permit a woman to teach, firstly. This is in the context of the household of God. What is not in view here is women leading in government or in business or in wider society. There are many capable Christian women who might well lead multinational companies, businesses and charities. But in the context of the church, they are not to be teachers, but rather place themselves under men. Because this is God's ordained pattern. And we see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Therefore an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectful, able to teach. In regard to teaching. Having said that, the Bible does encourage women to teach other women. For instance, in Titus 2, 4. Tells the older women to train the young women to love their husbands and children. And the women can teach children. 2 Timothy 1.5. Timothy was brought up by his grandmother and his mother and taught the faith. And women can also teach out of a public setting of public worship. For instance, in Acts 18.26, Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos aside. And they explain to him the way of God more accurately. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, in this church at Little Hill, there's a lady by the name of Leslie Rowe. She'll be teaching a series of lectures upon C.H. Spurgeon and Don John Bunyan and others. It won't be in a setting of public worship, but it'll be like in a lecture setting. She's a, what do you call her? I don't know. A lecturer, a PhD or something, I don't know. And she's, uh, she's going to be teaching men and women in that setting. This is in regards to the public worship of God. Okay, and the second prohibition, verse 12, or to exercise authority over a man. This is a distinctively different prohibition to the pro prohibition, I, permit, I do not permit a woman to teach. Uh, the Greek word of exercise authority over a man, authentio, is found only in this passage of Scripture. And it clearly means to exercise authority. It does not mean usurp authority or abuse authority, as it's often been argued. 
Therefore, since the office of pastor and elder is rooted in the task of teaching and exercising authority over the church, this verse excludes women from that service. 1 Timothy 3, 2. Scripture is saying that women must not be an authoritative teacher of doctrine in the church and exercise dominion over men in such a setting. This is man's appointed role under God. So when Paul is calling women to be rather be quiet, verse 12, it's in this respect to the teaching, which is limited to men who can teach and who are appointed to this authoritative office in the household of God. Similar instructions exist to the church in Corinth, as in all the churches, 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35. As we have already seen, it doesn't exclude women from speaking and praying in the life of the church. Women prayed and prophesied in the early church. And it tells us in the last days, men and women, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So this verse is not a blanket exclusion. It is the matter of teaching and preaching. And it does not exclude women from partaking in the worship of God. And then we, 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 we ask the question, well, why? Well, the biblical basis is not merely a response to the cultural context, but it's rooted in good biblical hermeneutics. That's the interpretation of Scripture. What does Scripture say throughout? What's the, what's the theme? What's the thread of going through? And he takes us back uh, to the creation and the account of the fall. Verse 13, the order of creation. Adam was formed first. It's not talking about the importance of one over the other here, but the order. The order. For instance, in the army, the army is structured. You, you have a colonel and you have a private at the top and the bottom and all in between. It's got a structure. Now, it doesn't mean that that person is a better person than the person down here. It just means that they've got different roles. They've got to do different things. They've got different responsibilities. And so it is uh, between men and women in the household of God. We have different roles to complement because they're all working together for the same purpose, the same goal, to the glory of God, <coughs> preparing themselves as a bride for Christ. And so this is seen throughout in the church, in the marriage, and in the wider society. And of course, that's all, that's all been detangled, it's all been deceived, it's all mixed up in the world, isn't it? But the, this, is the, this is God's ordained purpose for the church, it's to be different. Now, of course, we remember once upon a time, in some way, in the nation, it would have held to these Christian uh, ways, but even then they were distorted. And because you think, oh man, it's, you know, you just... You just they misunderstand it. A man is to cherish for his wife as he leads, as he leads his wife and loves his wife. And as the woman submits to his wife. And then we see that Eve was deceived first, not Adam. So the second reason they're giving the men alone are to teach and have the authority is because of the fall. The woman was misled by the snake, not the man. As Eve had ate the fruit and she had sinned, she then went on to seduce Adam and so he ate. So what we see here, rather than Eve placing herself under Adam, as she was taken from his side, as was her role, she usurped that and Adam failed to take up his role of leadership. She went off, did her own thing, he didn't bother her, she became the leader. And her leadership led Adam to sin. Now Paul is not teaching us here that women always lead men astray. He is simply saying in some circumstances, man should take up his leadership responsibilities in the church and in the home. That man should take up his responsibilities and not negate it. For that's what happened right at the beginning. And so we see that it's Adam who takes the rap for bringing sin into the world. Not Eve. As he is the head of the home, it's he who has failed 
in this situation. Romans 5.14, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But though Eve was deceived, and though Eve did this, it's Adam. It's Adam's responsibility. He never took up his leadership role. So we see that men and women have God ordained roles in the church. But the teaching of scripture clearly teaches that a woman is not permitted to teach and have a, exercise authority over a man in the household of God in regard to the preaching and teaching. And then in verse 15 he simply ends, doesn't he, with <laughs> it's, simply, it's a very difficult text <laughs> and uh, when I, I just skim through all this but basically it's consoling words here for, for women for the glorious role of women who are married that they are, are to be good mothers and care for their family and this is so downplayed today isn't it and seen unfitting for a modern woman and even oppressive somehow what utter nonsense but it's God's ordained blessing upon the role of women. Receiving spiritual blessings through bringing children into the world, teaching and training their children under God and running the household as they continue in the faith and love and holiness of life with self-control. Well, let's leave that there. Let's just pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we pray you'd help us to place ourselves under your word, to submit to your word, Lord. We thank you for the roles that you have given us as men and women. We thank you, Lord, that we are male and female. We thank you, Lord, that the head of the man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and we are all under Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we, in the household of God, might glorify you. Lord, that we might not seek to usurp your will and purposes for us as your people. We thank you that we are both made in the image of God. And we thank you, Lord, that we are both, as male and female, in Christ Jesus, one. But, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have give, brought this distinctiveness into your household and given us roles and structures whereby we might walk in them. We pray, Lord, that you might be glorified through it. Forgive us our many sins and our many transgressions in this matter and our many failings. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might change day by day and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing our hymn, which is going to lead us around the Lord's table now. Uh, 430 Amidst us our beloved stands and bids us view his pierced hands points to his wounded feet and side best blessed emblems of the crucified 430 
you see, if you couldn't sit up here, it was I'd be okay on these two chairs. Thank you very much. We think about the the character and beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and the roles within the divine economy of the Godhead and the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We see there's that leading, isn't it, and that mutual leading and submission and working together, doing the will of God to the glory of God. And I think something of, of, of the church is a reflection of, of God, isn't it, and the beauty of God. And we, it's difficult for us when we have hearts which are with the vestiges of sin, I should say, and our old nature's still rampant at times. But it's good that we can come round the table and we can confess our sins and we can ponder the beauty and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he submitted himself and gave himself, fulfilling the will of the Father gave his life and the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. I wonder if Gary would you would you be okay if you pray for us for, just for the, the ambulance and thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do thank you for our salvation in Christ. We do thank you, Lord, for uh, the person of Christ. We thank you for his life perfect sinless life we thank you for his uh, determination to satisfy uh, your will to do the work that he was sent to do to finish his work and Lord we thank you for his success and we thank you Lord that in his success we are granted access to the throne of grace, to the great fount of life, to these emblems here before us which signify and um, are emblematic of his broken body and his shed blood. And we thank you, Lord God, that if we walk faith and with determination and with um, your only beloved son at the forefront and centre of our lives we can please you through his work and through his sacrifice and so Lord we pray that you forgive us our sins, we pray Lord God that you wash us clean from that inevitable stain of sin which when we walk through this world, just uh, existing in this present order and state of things, we confess that sin is a part of our lives and needs to be repented of. But Lord, we know that if we confess our sins, you are just and willing to forgive us our sins. And we come before you earnestly this morning, asking for you to do that on our behalf, for we can have no other method of having these stains removed from us, Lord. Wash us clean, and Lord, bless us as we eat this meal together. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. If Gary, if you take the, the bread, thank you.
Lord Jesus was obedient, wasn't he? Obedient unto death. To do the Father's will. He gave his life for the ransom of his blood was shed and the tongue and sacrifice. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of the sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says, drink of it, all of you, to his beloved disciples around him. Now he bids us all to drink it. Remember him, 
that would be seen in these present. Until then, let's go in peace and speak in the word of the Lord. God bless. Thank you.
Yeah. 